Today as we come, we continue our study on the Lord's Prayer, okay? For us of sins, as we forgive those sins against us, or uh, trespasses of your worship you use. I'm going to play the same song that I played yesterday, but this is a, a slightly different compilation. Okay, I, I think it's, as you all know, it's done by one of our own in-house members, uh, our sister Catherine uh, composed this song. Eh? Okay, just enjoy this song first. Trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for us. Trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. that song okay so today we continue our uh, study of the Lord's Prayer okay the fifth petition forgive us our debts as we forgive those as of forgive our debtors of forgive our sins as we forgive those sins against us okay uh, I hope you have managed to read up uh, Matthew 18 verses 21 to 35 okay so we will not read that again and we go straight to our brother David Parsons sharing. Huh? We call this the Lord's Prayer, but it's a prayer he never used, and it's a prayer he could not have used. And we now come to the phrase in the Lord's Prayer that the Lord would never have said, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. He could have used the second half of that phrase because even when they spat on him and laughed at him and drove nails through his flesh, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But he couldn't have said the first bit because it was the unanimous testimony of friend and foe alike that this man was without sin and that if there ever had walked the earth a man who never needed to say, forgive me, it was this man because he was the spotless son of God. But the nearer you get to this man, the more you feel that you do need to pray it. The closer you live to the Lord Jesus, the more you feel that you must say every day, forgive us our trespasses. Indeed, it's those who've got really close to him who say, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now this prayer is a prayer for our use. It's a prayer for private use and daily use. Some people say we use the Lord's Prayer too often. I would say we don't use it often enough. We use it too often publicly, we don't use it often enough privately. We are meant to use this prayer or at least this model 
for our prayer every day in life. Give us this day implies that we use it every day, at least the model. Now this tells us a number of things about true prayer. Here's the first. True prayer must always include the word forgive as well as the word give. Now that may sound pretty elementary to say, but if you analyze your prayers, you may find that you use the word give far more than you use the word forgive. Give me this, give me that, give me health, give me comfort, give me money, give me peace, give me joy, give me, give me, give me. But a good prayer will always go on from give to forgive. This tells us also that we are to bring to God the needs of our soul as well as the needs of our body. And after having asked give me for my body, we ask forgive me for my soul. It tells me also that I must constantly remember that what I desire and what I deserve are two opposite things. When I say give me, I must remind myself immediately that I do not deserve to be given that thing. My desire and my deserts are different. And therefore when I say give, I do not deserve it, so I must say forgive straight away afterwards. And then it tells me that I ought to be thinking about my obligation to God as my Heavenly Father, as well as his obligation to me. If he is my Heavenly Father, he has an obligation to feed me and clothe me. That is why I need not worry about what I eat or drink or put on, because he is under an obligation. As a father, he has claimed me as his son, adopted me as his son. It is now his obligation to feed and clothe his children, and I can claim that. But if I only think of his obligations to me as my father and not of mine to him, then it's a very one-sided prayer. And my obligation to him is to live a holy life as he is holy and to live a perfect life as he is perfect and therefore I'll need to say forgive. Now this is the only petition with a condition attached to it. And many people have difficulties over this condition. Some of these difficulties are intellectual ones, and I'm going to deal with these, and I hope I won't put you off by so doing. But my understanding of this phrase is that I have far more practical difficulties than I have intellectual ones. And my sympathies are with the lady who was heard muttering as she went out of church, I'd like to see our vicar love my neighbor. <laughs> and I can understand fully the practical difficulties in this prayer. But there are certain intellectual difficulties. I hope I don't create difficulties for anyone by dealing with them. A group of aerodynamic experts once sat down and listened to one of their number prove conclusively, mathematically, on a board with figures that the bumblebee cannot fly. And while he was creating all the difficulties with his figures and his slide rule, the bumblebees were out busy getting honey. And one of the problems of discussing difficulties, intellectual difficulties in the pulpit, is that some people say, well, I never knew those difficulties existed. I just used to pray this prayer. But I know that a lot of you do have intellectual difficulties over this phrase. So I'm going to deal with them. And uh, if the others of you don't have these difficulties, then you can switch off and relax. And I'll tell you when to switch on again. Now, the first phrase, forgive us is an intellectual difficulty to some Christians. Some think it's psychologically bad for Christians to pray, forgive us our trespasses. They say it will breed an inferiority complex, a guilt complex. They'll always be digging around in their own soul for their sins and they'll become more and more ridden with fears before God. And what you want to do is get them away from all this sense of guilt and into joy and peace that never thinks of sin and thinks more of salvation. Now that's the psychological difficulty. The theological difficulty is this. I have met Christians who said they did not think we ought to use the Lord's Prayer because when they came to Christ all their sins were forgiven, past and future, and they were finished with that and could glory in it for the rest of their lives. I have heard the Church of England service criticized that it always begins with miserable sinners asking for forgiveness. 
and that if you're a Christian, you shouldn't start there. You have been forgiven, so don't ask for it, and don't go back to where you started. That's one theological difficulty, that when you begin the Christian life, you get forgiveness for everything, and you're finished with it from then on. The other theological difficulty comes from those Christians who believe in what is sometimes called entire sanctification, which John Wesley believed and taught, and which went from the early Methodists, I don't think the Methodists now believe it, but it went from the early Methodists to certain holiness movements and certain Pentecostal groups. And these would say, there can come a day in your life when you are entirely sanctified, after which you can be free from sin, and therefore you will not need the Lord's Prayer either. Now these are some of the difficulties that have been raised. And since they're real ones, I want to deal with them. Let me begin by saying that I think the Lord's Prayer was given to disciples, to followers of Christ. And therefore to say that we're finished with it doesn't really fit. He didn't give it to the crowds, he called his disciples to him. They said, teach us to pray, and he said, well, this is how to do it. And therefore I take it that he gave the Lord's Prayer to us who are following him as his disciples. Now there are two extremes that I think we need to avoid. One is the idea that there will never be any more need for confession or forgiveness in the Christian's life. I think that's an extreme view which you won't find here. It is to Christians that the Apostle John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's one extreme, that once you become a Christian, your sins are forgiven, you're finished. No more confession, no more forgiveness. The other extreme I've met is this, and it's an extraordinary one. I'm reminded of it by a dear lady who gave her testimony thus. I have been converted five times now, she said, and each time has been better than the last. And listening to her testimony, she seemed to be in and out of salvation between every Sunday and the next. And each day she was so bothered about sins that if she sinned once on Monday, she thought she'd lost her salvation and was no longer a Christian. So then she confessed it and she was a Christian by the Monday evening and then Tuesday she'd lost her salvation again. In, out, in, out. She didn't know where she was. Had no assurance that she was God's child forever. Now here are the two extremes, neither of which is biblical. On the one hand, those who say, I'm finished with sins altogether since I became a Christian. I don't need to keep coming back as a miserable sinner. And those who at the other end say, I never know whether I'm a Christian or not because I sinned yesterday and that undid all the good work and I've got to start again. Neither of these, and I've caricatured them both, is the biblical position. Let me take you into the upper room. A lot of our questions are sorted out in the upper room. And Jesus took a towel and girded himself and said, Peter, I want to wash your feet. And Peter said, now Lord, I'm finished with washing, you're not going to wash me. I'm not having you wash me anymore. And Jesus said, if I don't wash you, we can't be friends. He literally said, we, you can have no part with me, which means literally we can't have fellowship together. So then Peter swung to the other extreme and said, well wash me all over please. And Jesus gently said, you don't need washing all over now, you have been washed all over. But there's this dirt you've picked up on your feet that I want to clean, to keep the fellowship between us. Now I think he was saying something about this very issue. A Christian who's been born again and come to Christ has been washed all over, and the symbol of that is baptism, most appropriately, washing them head to toe. They have been washed clean, they are clean through the word of God. But as they walk through life, they're going to be picking dirt up on their feet. They will need a daily washing. And Jesus says, I want to wash your feet. Let me do so. If I don't wash your feet, we can't be friends. We can't have fellowship. In other words, what I'm saying is this, that if a Christian sins, as Christians do, and doesn't get that forgiven, they will lose their fellowship with the Lord. They are not losing their salvation, but they will lose their fellowship in the Lord. They lose their joy in prayer. 
they lose their life in worship they lose their desire to share Christ with other people they will lose their friendship with the Lord but they will not lose their salvation and it is this that Jesus was bothered about and it is this that the Lord's Prayer is about a daily cleansing to keep your fellowship with the Lord pure and sweet and clean just as when I married my wife that was final we married till death us do part we are linked together for the rest of our lives but if I do something wrong it will come between me and my wife and it needs to be dealt with I don't lose my marriage but we lose the fellowship and I've got to come and say I'm sorry I said that I shouldn't have done and the fellowship is restored that's what the Lord's Prayer is about it's not about your salvation it's about your fellowship with God now I can go further and prove this by asking you to look or at least no I can't unless you know Greek I'm going now to talk about the various words that the New Testament uses for sin and there are in fact five and they come in two groups there are two words very like each other and three words very like each other don't bother about the words I'll mention them in case some of you are making notes but even so forget the words but get the meaning now here's the first word it's a word called anomia which means sheer lawlessness a man who doesn't recognize any rules for his life who just plays the fool and does what he wants just sheer lawlessness anomia the second word is the word parabasis which means to step over which means to trespass to step over a line where there's a fence saying keep out you climb over it you have done this you have parabasis you have stepped over you have trespassed into forbidden territory now I'm going to say something that will I'm afraid uh, cause you to sit up and think neither of these two words is ever used in the scriptures in the Lord's Prayer it is assumed that Christians will not be deliberately lawless and will not deliberately and maliciously go where they ought not this is not what we ask for and it is a tragedy that the word trespass ever got into the Lord's Prayer it's not there what then are the three other words the first word is the word hamartia which means to miss your mark to fall short of the target it comes from archery and you fire the arrow and here's your target and the arrow plops down here you fell short of target that's a word that is used in the Lord's Prayer falling short of target and the next word the fourth word is the word paraptoma which means to fall on an icy road to slip when you did not intend to slip accidentally to do something that you had no intention of doing and the fifth and the last word which comes in this very Matthew 6 that we are taking is Ophilema and that means your debts what you owe and it is this word that comes in the Lord's Prayer now I don't know what you think about our singing the Lord's Prayer I'm not really bothered because I wanted you to sing that because it included the word debts I wish when we said it would use the word it's a far better word because it is not trespassing that we are thinking about it is falling short of our target and it is owing God something not having done what we should have done indeed this forgiveness is for things which we call sins of omission rather than sins of commission and if I may quote the book of common prayer it means precisely this we have left undone those things which we ought to have done is there any Christian in this chapel tonight who would dare get up and say I get to the end of the day without needing to say I have left undone the things I, have ought, I ought to have done is it not true that the nearer you get to Christ the more you feel that the less you do the more you feel the things that you might have said the thing the letters you might have written the persons you might have visited instead of watching television the more you look at your life the more you realize the things you didn't do 
And the Lord's Prayer is saying at the end of the day, recognize that there were things you should have done that you didn't. This is not so much concerned with the bad things you did as the good things you didn't. And that puts a different complexion on it. That can spoil your friendship with God. He wanted you to do that thing. He wanted you to write that letter. He wanted you to go and cheer that person up. He wanted you to go and tell someone about Christ. And you owed him that. And at the end of the day, Jesus says, get your debts paid. Now my great-grandfather, you could set your clock by him. He went round the village at five o'clock on Saturday evening paying all his debts. He would never enter the Lord's Day a penny in debt. And they would always say, there goes old Porson paying his debts. And they would set their watches by him. Five o'clock Saturday. Now God is saying you need to do that every day with God. Get the accounts straight with God and go to bed straight. We can go a little further than this. Jesus once told a parable about a servant who was plowing the field or minding sheep and who came in and who then was going to sit down but his master said bring my meal first so the servant had to go on and bring the meal and you might have said well that's really adding insult to injury he's worked hard all day now you make him give the meal and then Jesus said do you think that servant should be thanked for doing that extra thing for his master no because when he has done all he is commanded he has only done his duty likewise you also when you have done what you have been commanded have only done your duty you are still when you have done your best unprofitable servants and I underline that word unprofitable when I've done my best for God I get to the end of the day in debt to God for what I haven't done I am still unprofitable he's still done more for me than he ever got back from me and I'm still in debt and I need to pray about this 1 John says that if anyone says he hasn't got this he deceives himself I might add that he doesn't deceive anyone else now the second phrase that has caused difficulty to people is as we forgive and the difficulty I can express like this is not the gospel of Christ free forgiveness free grace no conditions no bargains no contracts that God says if you repent and believe you're forgiven and here we are in the Lord's Prayer being told to do something for someone else before God will forgive us is this not salvation by good works isn't this God going right against the principle of free grace and saying I won't forgive you your sins until you've been out and done something for someone else is that not bargaining is it not putting a condition to forgiveness well now may I be again begin by saying this is not about our first conversion this prayer is not a prayer for the unbeliever and it was never meant to be it is a prayer for the Christian for the believer every day what then does the condition mean does it mean that God has laid down a kind of law that unless we pass forgiveness on he won't forgive it forgive us is it a kind of spiritual law of the universe that the positive lead that comes to us from God doesn't produce any current unless the negative earth is earthed in my neighbor is that what is meant and I've heard many sermons say that I don't think it is that God can't forgive you under these conditions I think it is simply that he won't and the real reason why he doesn't forgive those Christians who don't forgive others is this it's very simple he doesn't feel like it he doesn't feel like it it is the feelings of God that matter now before any of you really wonder what I'm saying let me tell you where I found it I found it in the parable I read to you just before the last hymn Jesus said a king in his generosity and pity forgave a man 300 pounds and then he heard that that man went out and flung a, a fellow man into jail for seven pounds ten and the king was angry and said I take back my forgiveness and Jesus is saying it is how God feels about your unforgivingness that is the thing 
And I can understand that if God is my father, I know how he feels because I'm a father. And if my three children come and say, Daddy, can I have a sweet? And I give a sweet to each of them. And then I find that my boy stole the two sweets from the other two girls and went and ate all three in the garden and then had the cheek to come back and say, can I have another sweet? I will say, you're not getting another sweet from me. I'm very cross with you. Now, why am I cross? Why am I angry? Because he did this. There's a very simple reason. Because I don't want him to grow up like that. And if I went on indulging him, he would grow up nasty, selfish, a thief. And God wants us to grow up like himself. And he wants us to be forgiving as he is forgiving. And therefore he says, if I forgave you each day your debts and you were not forgiving others, I would be encouraging you to go on behaving like that. And I'm not that kind of a father. I'm cross with you. And if you're not prepared to forgive others their debts, then I'm not going to forgive yours. I'm angry. Now I can understand that it makes sense in this context God is just telling us how he feels about us. And he's talking about his children, believers, Christians, and he's saying, do you expect me to go on wiping out your debts if you don't wipe out others' debts? If I go on doing that, I am doing you harm. I am indulging your sin. I am destroying your character. And I am not that kind of a father. I thank God that my earthly father wouldn't have let me get away with this. And I thank God my heavenly father does, doesn't either. Now he's stated what his feelings are and I can see his reasons for it. An unforgiving person doesn't know what he's asking for when he says forgive. An unforgiving person will not appreciate forgiveness even if he gets it. An unforgiving person will be made more unforgiving if he is forgiven under those circumstances. And God's will is to grow up like him, as Alfred Lord Tennyson, the poet, put it. Forgive him seventy times and seven, for all the blessed souls in heaven are both forgiving and forgiven. In other words, be like your heavenly father, and God will not forgive your debts at the end of each day if you are not learning to be like him. Otherwise, that would not be good fatherhood, it would be bad discipline. It was General Oglethorpe, the civil servant, whom Wesley approached on behalf of a convict to plead for the convict. And General Oglethorpe said to John Wesley, I never forgive. And John Wesley quietly said to him, then I hope, sir, that you never sin. This is what it's about. I can sum this up in two words. Forgiving, forgiven. That's the law for Christians. Now the practical difficulties. My difficulties with this are not intellectual. They're in the heart. They're not in my head. They're down here. St. Augustine called this petition in the Lord's Prayer the terrible petition. The terrible petition. A modern scholar has said of all the petitions in the Lord's Prayer, this is the most frightening to me. And Robert Louis Stevenson, who led his family in family prayers every day and always finished with the Lord's Prayer, in the middle of one day at breakfast time, in the middle of family prayers, got up and walked out of the dining room. And his wife went out and said, what's the matter, Robert? What's the matter? He said, I'm not fit to pray that prayer today. And she said, why? And he then shared with her a resentment, a malice that had been brooding in his heart since the previous day. He said, I can't pray that prayer today. It's easy enough to say, give us this day our daily bread. There are no conditions attached. God will give us that for the asking. But here he says, I can't give you this for the asking. Not unless. And if I am praying this prayer while I'm nursing grudges, bitterness, resentment, jealousy, then I am literally asking God not to forgive my debts. And that's a terrible prayer. I came across this in uh, Mrs. Gaskell's book, Sylvia's Lovers. Sylvia refuses to forgive the man who brought about her father's condemnation as a criminal, and he was a criminal, and his execution. And, sh and somebody, a dear lady, says to Sylvia, it's said in the Bible, Sylvia, that we're to forgive. 
She says, I, there's some things as I know I never forgive and there's others as I can't and I won't either. But Sylvie, you pray to be forgiven your trespasses as you forgive them as trespass against you. And Sylvie replies, well, if I'm to be taken at my word, I'll not pray at all, that's all. It's well enough for them as has but little to forgive, to use them words. I tell thee my flesh and blood wasn't made for forgiving and forgetting. Once for all thou must take my word, when I love I love and when I hate I hate, and him as has done harm to me or to mine, I may keep from striking or murdering, but I'll never forgive. That's a very human passage from a novel, but it's a very tragic one, because it finds an echo in our hearts. Because forgiveness is not just the absence of not doing any harm to someone, it's the positive going to them and re-establishing relationships. I once went to a woman whom I knew was not speaking to another woman in the church and I said, can't you forgive her what she did? And she said, I have done, I'm not speaking to her anymore, but I've forgiven her. And I said, you haven't forgiven her. Don't call that forgiveness. Well, she said, I'm not going to do her any harm and I'm not going to say a thing against her. But she wouldn't say a thing to her. That's not forgiveness. I find this very hard. It is a rare and a beautiful thing when you see human beings forgive each other. It is rare. I remember reading of a businessman who went out to India with his young wife and he went to Calcutta and he traveled all around India on business while she stayed in Calcutta. And he got into wrong ways and he got into trouble with women and crooks and he wrecked his life. She wondered what was wrong and she kept asking why he looked so worried and why he was losing weight. He wouldn't tell her, just said he was busy. And then one day he couldn't stand it any longer and he told her the whole sordid story and she staggered back against the wall as if he'd struck her with a whip. And he said, for the first time in my life I saw love crucified by sin. And then, this is the point of the story, she did a beautiful thing. She came and she put her arms round his neck and she said, we'll put this right together. Now that's forgiveness, real. And it's a rare and a beautiful thing. I remember seeing it in Berlin. I saw in Berlin and I went up and just shook the hands out of sheer joy. Betty Elliot, whose husband was murdered by the Alka Indians, walking along arm in arm with two Alka Indians who had murdered her husband and made her a widow. And since they didn't know anything about Western civilization and had come straight from the jungle, she was teaching them how to use a knife and fork, how to go to the toilet, all the kinds of things that needed to be taught like little children. That's the practical difficulty of forgiveness. How does a woman like that take her husband's murderers and teach them how to use a knife and fork? Well, that's the practical difficulty of saying as we forgive. It's not the intellectual difficulties that stop me saying the Lord's Prayer, it's this one. And the other practical difficulty is with the phrase, forgive us. Don't know if you ever realized how difficult it is for God to forgive you. Now with us, if I can't forgive my neighbor, it's my pride, it's myself, it's my reputation, it's my rights, and I've got to crucify self to forgive him. But with God it's not that, it's not his pride. Why does God find difficulty? I'll tell you, because of his purity, because of his holiness, because of his goodness. He just can't bear sin at all. He hates it. How does he get around the difficulty of my debts? I will tell you in a word by paying them for me. That's the only thing that makes it possible for God to forgive my debts by paying them on my behalf. Do you know that the word forgive in the Hebrew language means two things. It means to remit a debt and it also means to pay it. And the same word does for both. And so in the Hebrew language you use the same word for remitting a debt and for paying it. And God finds it so difficult to remit our debt until the debts were paid. Now in the Middle East if you're in debt 
Your debts are written up on a sheet of paper and they're pinned up in the marketplace for everyone to see. That's an added incentive to get them paid quickly. But if a man is willing to pay your debt and remit it for you, he will come along and fold it over like that, put a nail through it and write his own name across the sheet of paper. And your debts are done. And in Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 2, verse 14, Paul says that God has in Christ taken the bond of debts which was written against us and nailed it to the cross. Finished it and written across it the name of Jesus. Forgive us our debts. It's as difficult for God to forgive us as it is for us to forgive others. But the practical difficulties was resolved at the cross and every act of forgiveness is written in the blood of Jesus. And finally, is there anything like the joy of forgiveness? Of knowing that it's over and done with. Of knowing that the person who's forgiven you will never mention it again. Of knowing that they love you, that they will give you the fatted calf, the ring on your finger, the shoes on your feet, the robe on your back, and bring you home. That's forgiveness. Forgive us our debts. All that we owe to you every day, Lord, forgive us as we forgive those who owe things to us and never give them to us. Let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we confess that forgiveness is not something we know as much about as we ought either forgiveness from you or forgiveness to others. We pray that you will help us to forgive one another as Christ forgave us. We pray that you will help us to get the debts cleared every day before we go to rest. We pray from the bottom of our hearts that you will keep us very close to the cross and that saying the Lord's Prayer will take us to Calvary, knowing that that prayer could never be answered, apart from his bearing our sins on the tree. We ask it in his name. Amen.